Hello there. Welcome back to the booth here at Pro Tour Rivals of Ixalan. That's Luis Scott Vargas and Marshall Sutcliffe. It's our pleasure to bring you coverage here live from Bilbao, Spain. We've got semifinal number two lined up for you in the future match area. Jerry Thompson from the United States, Pascal Vieren from Belgium. They're all ready to go. Let's head down. It's time for the second semifinal match. Hello and welcome to coverage of Pro Tour Rivals of Ixalan. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe in the booth with Luis Scott Vargas, and we're ready for semifinal number two. We've already got one finalist all lined up. This one, though, is going to be decided between these two gentlemen, Jerry Thompson from the United States. You take a look at Jerry T. This is his third Pro Tour top eight. He, of course, is a Pro Tour champion as well. Across from him is Pascal Vieren. This is his first Pro Tour top eight for Pascal in his ninth Pro Tour start. Luis, you know where he uh, made his debut? I do not. It was a memorable one for you, buddy. Berlin, 2008. Oh, wow. Yeah, that was his first Pro Tour. So Pascal's been at it for a long time. Um, but this is the first time he's actually found himself in the top eight. Now, as far as matchups go, Luis, can you break it down for us? We've got two pretty cool decks and decks you don't see every day in modern. So they're both Pyromancer decks. You know, you've got Blue Red Pyromancer against Mardu Pyromancer. But I, I think that the differences between these decks is actually a little deeper than that. Mm -hmm. Basically, they are both mid-range slash controlling decks. They're trying to stop what the opponent's doing and win with Pyromancer slash Bedlam Reveler or Thing in the Ice in Pascal's case. But the main difference is Pascal has more ways to draw cards and specifically... Ancestral Vision. He actually played Serum Visions on turn one, the wrong kind of vision from his perspective. Uh, Jerry would be much less happy if that was a suspended Ancestral because this matchup's slow enough that those Ancestrals are going to resolve and are going to draw Pascal a lot of extra cards. Jerry does have his own, you know, mechanisms for card draw. He's got Bedlam Reveler and Faithless Looting to improve card quality, but in a long, drawn-out game, the player who draws more cards is generally going to be able to win. And both these players are just throwing removal spells at each other. They both have a lot more removal than they do than the opposing player has threats. So you're, you're, you're going to see a really big war of attrition. Lingering Souls is critical from Jerry's side. Thing in the Ice from Pascal's side. The one kind of funny interaction that we were talking about before the round started, Thing in the Ice returns all non-horror creatures. And right. Bedlam Reveler is a horror. How weird. You know what the funny thing is? I don't know, know who that's good for. Because... <laughs> Jerry would not mind that Bedlam Reveler point. being returned a lot of the time. No, that's absolutely true. And, of course, Thing in the Ice dwarfs the bedroom, Bedlam Reveler. And here we go. One of the key cards for the matchup, Young Pyromancer. It's a card that both lists share. I don't expect it to stay around on the battlefield long against either player, to be honest. Pascal has many main deck answers, and Jerry Thompson has a few himself. And Jerry just running out the Pyromancer on turn two, just hoping Pascal does not have a way to kill it. But unfortunately for Jerry, Pascal does. In fact, Pascal's hand looks quite well set up here with Lightning Bolt, you know, in, in two copies of and Logic Knot in order to stop whatever Jerry plays next. And an Ancestral Vision, which, you know, better late than never. Part of the reason that card is so good in this matchup is Pascal can suspend it on turn three, four, five. And eh, the game's probably still going to last long enough for him to, to yield the, the benefit. Yeah, that logic knot could be a problem for Jerry Thompson. One of the things that you'll see as far as play patterns go with the deck that he's chosen here is when he resolves that first Bedlam Reveler, it tends to chain. He will, he will usually find some action and find maybe another way to find more Bedlam Revelers and kind of keep that yeah, you need those more than me. train rolling. Yeah, and despite being a Mardu deck, you know, featuring no blue, Jerry deck sees a lot of cards. Between Bedlam Reveler and Faithless Looting, he's yeah. able to churn through his deck faster than you might expect. Jerry's just going to flash back Faithless Looting here. He does have a Lingering Souls in his graveyard as well. But Jerry may not want to go deep on the tokens before that thing in the ice flips, because once it flips, it's going to you know return all the tokens and and hence kill them. Yeah, but you can't be happy if you're Jerry Thompson if your game plan is revolving around when Thing in the Ice flips, right? <laughs> it's not like it's an easy creature to get rid of. Yeah, 
And Injury's main deck, he's got, got one Terminate one and one Dread Boar that can kill a uh, thing in the ice as well as two copies of Fatal Push. Here's Opt from Pascal Vieren. Opt seen quite a bit of modern play since it was printed in Ixalan. Sometimes replacing Serum Visions, though in Pascal's case, it's complementing it. Yeah, they're the big three blue cantrips uh, in in modern right now. Thought Scour, Serum Visions, and Opt. And depending on your deck's goals, you know, you, you play some selection of those, though very few decks play all three of them. Mm -hmm. As well as, eh, there's also Sleight of Hand for, for those more inclined to up the storm count yeah, or perhaps cast Ad Nauseam. So there's actually a lot of different options at uh, one mana. Still say Serum Visions is the premium. That one gets played by the most decks because right. uh, it can frequently get played by Death Shadow, decks like control decks like Pyromancer or Jeskai, and then Storm as well. Funnily enough, no, no one seems to, to favor Ponder or Preordain. <laughs> I don't think you're correct that nobody seems to favor it. <laughs> Yeah, you may have broken modern, Luis. Yeah, I think I solved it. And Pascal, he, Pascal, careful to leave up Logic Knot. He's just got one of those in the main deck, but he has it in his hand. And here's Inquisition of Kozilek. Yes, how many? Huh? How many do you have? Four. And in this particular spot, because Jerry can just take the Logic Knot, I think that it is fairly good value to, to Logic Knot, the Inquisition, and then you get to flip thing in the ice, putting a 7-8 a into play. Were, were you asking mana or cards? I have three mana. Yeah, I was asking cards. Uh, okay. uh, it's, it's four around this triggers. Okay. So that's exactly what Pascal's going to do, and he gets Awoken Horror out of the deal as well. And I heard him announce the Logic Knot for four here. So presumably the Inquisition gets countered. That is what happened. And Jerry, I think, pausing there, and part of the reason to pause might be, be to indicate you maybe have double Lightning Bolt and you want to kill the thing in the ice before it flips, but... Oh, sure. That Jerry doesn't actually have that, and... Uh, well, this could get ugly now for Jerry Thompson because Pascal Viren has Awoken Horror and that is a very fast clock, just three turns. Jerry Thompson's gonna be compelled to start chump blocking with Lingering Souls tokens. And Pascal Viren does not stop there. He plays Young Pyromancer, but after having waited a little while for it, he can play it and opt in the, for, in the turn. So even if it were to die, he's gonna get a little bit of value back out of it. And with a Cryptic Command in hand, Pascal's really not unhappy with anything. Drawing lands is fine because you can cast Cryptic and uh, drawing spells while well, you can cast basically everything else as well. So, one choice that may have paid dividends for Pascal this weekend is he actually doesn't have Blood Moon in his list anywhere. Oh, wow. Which is funny. He's got Field of Ruin as his like land hate of choice, but I, I bet a lot of his opponents expected Blood Moon out of this deck. Because look at the lands he has in play. Three mm -hmm. islands and, and a Steam Vents. Yeah, basics galore. It's actually critical that they're snow-covered islands. Why Be is that critical? Uh, because Pascal likes the picture, presumably. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> how critical are we talking here? Matches thing in the ice. Well, well one, frozen one, wasteland one advantage of playing snow-covered island plus normal islands, if you lead on Spire Bluff, normal island, snow-covered island, a lot of your opponents will think you're playing Storm. Because you can gifts on given for island sure. snow covered island, sure. and you found it. Look, we're looking for tiny edges yeah, here. That's about as tiny as they get, but you got it. Now, Jerry Thompson, he finds collective brutality here in a window where it can't get cryptic commanded, and he actually nabs a cryptic with it. And Jerry did a similar play to what Pascal did last turn by playing Young Pyromancer and then also playing a spell that turn that triggered, and that was a really that was a nice collective brutality. He killed the opposing Pyromancer and Nab Cryptic Command with it. Yeah, I still think that that vision ticking down, is, you know, oh, yeah. is, is going to be trouble for Jerry. And Thing in the Ice is eating uh, 
a token a turn. There's Roast. Yes, that is in the main deck for Viren, and that's going to take down young Pyromancer and put this one nearly out of reach for Thompson. I feel like, you know, roasting a young Pyromancer really is adding insult to injury. It feels like the Pyromancer should be the one doing the roasting, and all of a sudden it's, <laughs> it's, it's eating five points of damage. And no kidding. Well, speaking of young Pyromancer, let's make it two of them. Jerry well, Thompson's going to play both and pass the turn, kind of hold his breath here. This is a big swing, because if Pascal misses on this vision, he actually could end up in a spot where he, he gets ground down by Pyromancers and the Bedlam Reveler in Jerry's hand. Well, he didn't miss. He found a roast as well as an abrade and, and a, a second, second red, red mana source. source. So yeah, that, so. That's Scalding Tarn. Things looking very good for Pascal Vieren from Belgium to pick up game number one. Potentially overpowering Jerry Thompson. And now it's critical also that he has a snow-covered mountain. <laughs> Actually, that one, that one is just, I think, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, again, just because he likes the picture better. <laughs> I'm sure you'll find some edge that you can get. I could probably make something up. Maybe his opponents will play around Scred. There it is. Okay, once again, Pascal Vieren continues the assault, and Jerry Thompson continues chump blocking with tokens. Another young pyromancer for Vieren. This is the fourth one to hit the battlefield, and he's going to take good advantage by taking out one of the young Pyromancers, but leaving himself with one. He is on the front foot. Jerry, unfortunately for him, can't cast the Bedlam Reveal unless he drew, draws land number five, which looks like he did pick up, but he does have three spells in his graveyard. He does not have the full six you would want. So Jerry's going to be able to play Bedlam Reveler this turn, but Pascal's going to untap with Pyromancer in play, Removal to kill Reveler or Pyromancer, and still, of course, that thing in the ice is just, you know, getting in there. Awoken Horror gets very angry when enough spells are played. Mm -hmm. Really need Metamorphos in the land there. Metamorphos, I guess. Jerry only has one Metamorphos in his main deck, and he's teasing himself that he should have played more of them. All right, let's see if he can find an answer for the Awoken Horror. Good. He's going to be tapped out this turn regardless, but he's at 14, so he's likely to survive the turn. It's just a matter of if he can untap. Oh, he did. He actually found a Terminate. All right. Wow, he's... these roasts, though, are really doing work. That was Young Pyromancer number two into Roast again on the Bedlam Reveler, clearing the way for another big attack. And Jerry's in an unenviable position now of deciding if he wants to chump lock with his young Pyromancer. But in the enviable position of playing in the semifinals of the Pro Tour. Yes, big picture, he's doing fine. Within the context of this game, less so. So what Jerry needs to do here, he's gonna potentially trade Pyromancers Take nine, fall to five, terminate the Awoken Horror, be facing down lethal, so he needs to draw, like a Lingering Souls would be perfect. A removal spell for Pyromancer into Lingering Souls would also work pretty well. He also he also had the option of not blocking and hoping to string together multiple spells, but no matter what happens, Jerry needs to draw something this turn. Lilian of the Veil not looking great against a board full of 1-1 tokens. Bedlam Reveler was the draw. Unfortunately for Jerry, he just hasn't drawn enough land or spells to, to, to make it so that his Bedlam Revelers are very cheap. They're kind of inefficient at five mana. If Jerry had a land that didn't deal damage to himself, then he'd be able to go terminate, play Bedlam Reveler, block Pyromancer, fall to one. Yes. But he's got Black Cleave Cliffs, which enters the battlefield tapped, which means he's just a little bit short of surviving this next turn. Liliana minus two, and then uh, Pascal sacrifices the token. And this is just desperation here for Thompson. He's just gonna run the Re Bedlam Reveler out there, take a look at the three cards, and scoop up his permanence because Pascal Vieren has won game number one. 
to the Belgian player. Impressive stuff from Pascal, able to uh, remove all of the threats on the other side of the table while backing it up with young pyromancers and eventually overwhelming Jerry Thompson with Thing in the Ice slash Awoken Horror. Great mm. stuff from this blue-red pyromancer deck. It is a sweet one. And Vieran rode it to victory pretty easily there. He got ahead and never really relinquished the lead. Yeah, the the real killer there was the Ancestral Vision. I think yeah. that that's, they were trading cards, and all of a sudden, Vieran was up three cards with the expenditure of just one mana. That's right. So that's game number one in the books here in semifinal number two. We're going to come back, finish thing finish this thing off right after these messages. Head down to your local store and buy a box of Rivals of Ixalan to receive an Alt Art Foil Rare Captain's Hook. Limit one per customer. Visit RivalsofIxalon.com to find a store. Looking for a place to hang out and play Magic? Head to your local game store this and every Friday to play Friday Night Magic events. Get more info at magic.wizards.com slash FNM. And welcome back to the feature match area here in Bilbao, Spain. We're in semifinal number two. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe. I'm in the booth with Luis Scott Vargas. And in the feature match area, we have Pascal Vieran versus Jerry Thompson. Pascal up a game, impressive fashion as well. But now Jerry Thompson gets to be on the play. He's going to kick things off with a land and a go. You know, one of the things I, I like. Ooh, ancestral Vision to suspend it on turn one. Do you like that? I, I do like that. I, I'm a fan of, it, of any format that involves Ancestral Vision. You, you, I was going to say, you know what I like best about this matchup mm. is this is one of the matchups where I think being on the player draw doesn't matter as much. Okay. Uh, just because 19. it's a pretty long matchup. It's not actually that tempo-based. You'd rather be on the play. Jerry did choose to go first. But it's not like when you're playing Hollow Ones against Tarmogoyfs or trying to establish a Lantern Lock. Well, I think that the game's going to last long enough that it's going to even out fairly well. But Jerry went and fetched up white mana here. Of, of note, Foundry. Sacred Foundry is Jerry's only white source. So if Pascal Vieran targets it with Field of Rune, Jerry's going to be unable to cast Lingering Souls directly. He can still discard Lingering Souls to Collector Brutality or Liliana and flash it back. Wow. And he's got the one mana Morphos if he really wants to get spicy. Okay. But he, he is exposing it to a bit of risk here. Wow, look at this. Two lightning bolts hit the bin. Off of Faithless Looting, and now we're going to see... Oh, look, at, look at the hand from Pascal Vieran. <laughs> yeah, that, Paul that, Chion's probably looking at this on the screen going, yes! That, that hand is definitely thick. He's got lots of cryptic commands. He's got <laughs> remand and thing in the ice. And Inquisition of Kozlek can only take 
uh, the one of the two mana cards here. By the way, I have confirmation that Paul is in fact freaking out. Triple Crypto Command. <laughs> you got to figure if he can get to that, it, get to the point of actually casting those, that he's going to be in great shape. I would keep that hand in a heartbeat. Turn one vision and lots of cryptics in a slower matchup. Like, Jerry is not pressuring your life total very fast at all. No. Jerry's going to use Dreadbore. And by the way, to back up your point here, Luis, Pascal's at 20. Jerry has no threats whatsoever. It's just hand disruption and now a Dreadbore to kill Thing in the Ice. Though the land drops are important here for Pascal Viren, and he's going to use an op to find one. Yeah, when you, when you cast Opt, you're, you know, your heart's beating in your chest. You're like, can I just sail land just one time? You see an island, it's just the best thing you've ever seen. Perfect, yeah. Because, you know, with triple Cryptic Command, it's kind of interesting, right? Cryptic's a very high-value card. You mm -hmm. want to use it, you know, in, in high-leverage situations, like tap your whole team, counter your critical spell. When you've got three of them in a Suspend Division, that changes completely. You're just looking to fire them off. Oh, yeah. All of a sudden, you're going to see Pascal bouncing land end of turn and drawing a card, just trying to get, get something going. Because yeah. with Triple Cryptic, you know that you, you know, you've, you've got the long game locked up. And in fact, Snapcaster Mage gives, gives him essentially a fourth Cryptic if he wants it. Ooh, thoughts he's off the top for Jerry Thompson can help stem the bleeding a little bit. What Jerry really needed was that turn one Inquisition to take that Ancestral. Yes. So it's going to be hard. This is, you know, this is a, a tale as old as time. The, the kind of like bl mid-range black disruptive deck against the blue deck with Ancestral Vision and Cryptic Command. We've, we've been seeing this battle play out for 10 years, and I can tell you which side I would rather be on. And yeah. not just because I like casting Ancestral Vision. I, I actually do think that the blue side tends to have an advantage here. All right. Well, Jerry gets to cast his own Ancestral Vision here. It's Bedlam Reveler, though. It doesn't require him to discard a few spells, so... Not quite as good. But he gets a 3-4 with Prowess out of the deal. Yeah, and that is not bad. Pascal does not have red mana yet, and he doesn't have a way to kill it, so he might d take a little bit of a hit here. And in fact, this turn is, is not great for him. No. He's going to use Field of Ruin to take out Jerry's only white source. And as you mentioned, that's the only one in the library. That's it. That's his whole ability to get white. But even though this turn was a, a bit of a whiff for Pascal, next turn he's going to draw three off the Ancestral, and he's going to have his draw step, so presumably he's hitting his fourth land drop. And once you have the shields up, yeah, maybe he takes two hits from Bedlam Reveler, but he's got cryptics for days afterwards. You know, one interesting thing, Jerry Thompson, one of the cards in his hand is actually Blood Moon. Well. <laughs> he brought that in, and right as we see that, we see him. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh well, he, 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 this is game one still, so he's... he's, he's of course, he's, he can bring it in. got so the main deck Blood Moon. He just has the one of them? He's no, got two main two deck Blood them. Moons. He's certainly going to be taking them out against an opponent with I was gonna millions say, of basic <laughs> lands. It's really bad here. But of course, we are playing best three out of five rather than your normal best two out of three. So Jerry's stuck with those Blood Moons. Until next game. <laughs> so Jerry can, he could Blood Moon to deal a point of damage with the, the prowess trigger off Bedlam Reveler, but I think he'd rather discard it to Faithless Looting here. Flashback looting triggers. Alright, he's going to flashback Faithless Looting. Well, Jer Let's see Jerry, what he finds. He can get rid of the Blood Moon this way. Yeah, he, he's making up some ground, and uh, so. all of a sudden, you know, he does, despite having a deck that does not pressure the opponent all that well, Here. He's got, you know, Pyromancer and Bedlam Reveler in play, so he's got some threats. I, I still think Pascal is doing fairly well for himself, though. He does have to hit on this draw step. I mean, as you say that, he's resolving Ancestral Vision. He's got to be feeling good about that. That's four cards going into hand this turn for him. Though he can't cast Cryptic this turn. He still can't. Drew another Field of Ruin. Well, let's see if he can set that up, though, for next turn, because he has Young Pyromancer into Serum Visions. So he found the Misty Rainforest All that right. can go get his snow-covered island. And he's got another Serum Vision, so he's, he's going to be able to cast enough spells after that Pyromancer here to, to at least throw out some chump blockers. Vision into Vision. But, of course... These aren't just cantrips at this point, as they're generating advantage thanks to Young Pyromancer. 
And that thing is going to start taking over the board. It looks like Pascal Vieren's in a much better position to take advantage of it as well. Jerry ended up with collective brutality in his hand after that faithless looting. Yeah, and Jerry knows at least three of the cards in Pascal's hand, so he's <laughs> he knows what he's in for if he casts collective brutality. And he's going to be able to, you know, discard whatever he draws as well if he wants to, to take out the Pyromancer on the way, but Pascal has, has a backup if he needs it. <laughs> he found Inquisition of Kozilek against an opponent with three Crypta commands in hand. Well... The, the question is, do there you is cast Inquisition or, or do you just uh, discard it to Collective Brutality? And I think given that you want to get Young Pyromancer off the board with Brutality, so you're casting it, mm -hmm. you might as well discard Inquisition because you, you, you know you'll hit Cryptic Command instead of potentially missing on something else. Of course, there is also Snapcaster Mage still in hand for Pascal. This is a lot of problems for Jerry Thompson to deal with. So minus two to the Pyromancer, which will kill it. Take a look at your hand. And now this can let him take away the Cryptic. Inquisition can take away Snapcaster, but not, not the uh, Collective Brutality, so. And despite Jerry being ahead on board here, Pascal can just chump the Bedlam Reveler, take a cool one point of damage, and next turn have up Cryptic, then the turn after that have up Pyromancer plus Cryptic or Snapcaster plus whatever he wants. He drew Thing in the Ice for the turn as well. Could do a lot of resetting. I mean, Look Jerry doesn't draw hand. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is. Holy smokes, I'm jealous. Boy. He, if Jerry doesn't draw a spell, Thing in the Ice could actually block <laughs> the, the uh, Bedlam Reveler here. That's true. It's not inconceivable that Pascal wants to do that, or he can go Pyromancer, Snapcaster, Serum Vision or opt and put more power on the board, n n another token enabled that it's able to chump block and make sure he hits a little bit of card flow. So uh, I like this line. Plus, this uses five mana, so he's able to, to keep up the two cryptics because cryptic is much more effective when you already have a board presence. Right. Like you said, he, he would be forced to just start using it for kind of short-term gains and start drawing some cards off of them. Serum Visions it is. See some lands, and he's just going to push them to the bottom. He drew one with it as well. And he passes the turn back in a similar position to the one he was before. Except Pascal's just not going to run out of things to do, and no. Jerry's just living at the mercy of the top of his deck. Right. Bedlam Reveler or Bust for Thompson. Yeah, Bedlam Reveler is one of the cards that could get him out of it. He's got to draw as many of these as he can. Cold Guns Command would also be pretty nice. Take out the Young Pyromancer, return Bedlam Reveler if he's got one in his graveyard, and then just slam or, or maybe even make Pascal discard a card. What he drew is a Bloodstain Mire. He'll likely keep that in his hand in case he finds Faithless looting down the line. Jerry passes a turn back to Pascal. Another land off the top of the library for Viren, but he is looking in good shape to be up two games to zero here in our second semifinal match. And here's Thing in the Ice, yet again for Pascal Viren. Thing in the Ice with Cryptic Command up, Pyromancer, Forget Snapcaster it. back to block. I mean, the shields are up. Jerry's probably thinking something similar. Well, there's that Faithless looting we talked about a minute ago. Jerry's going to be glad he kept the, uh, the land in hand, but the truth of the matter is, is that anything really problematic from Pascal's perspective is easily dealt with thanks to Cryptic Command times two in hand. Cryptic is very difficult to cast with triple blue in the mana, but boy, does it reward you for setting up your deck to do so. He puts the, Faithless Looting on the stack. Yeah, and Cryptic Command really just does get you out of almost any situation. Mm -hmm. If you're losing badly, it can tap down their team. If you're winning, it can counter their key spell. And that's what we're going to see here. This is actually really interesting. Okay. He 
countered it. Huh. I mean, Jerry can just flash it right back again. Does tap him out. Effectively so. And let them see fewer cards. Pascal also may not want Jerry to be dumping uh, Lingering Souls into his graveyard because he can strand them. Because, again, Jerry, Jerry's only method of casting Lingering Souls right now is Mana Morphos or discarding it and flashing it back. That Field of Ruin did a number on Jerry. It really did. Has yet to be relevant this game, but Pascal doesn't know that, and he, he wants to play around it. Jerry has cast two, two spells worth of prowess triggers here, but uh, it's just an easy chump block for Pascal. One of the uh, elemental tokens is going to jump under the bus, and again, Pascal is still looking great. This is what Jerry ended up finding. It's going to take away Ancestral Vision. That's Inquisition of Kozilek, but still a cryptic command in hand for Pascal. Finds a lightning bolt off the top of his library as well. That is not bad. Do a number on the young pyromancer. At some point, Pascal may want to end up bouncing his own Snapcaster with Cryptic Command. That's the sort of thing that happens once you have lots of mana and not as much action. And here we go. The chain begins. So this is on upkeep. Pascal says, I want to tap your team down, and I'm going to return Snapcaster Mage to my hand. This is a way to generate value. Oh, yeah, and he's doing it on upkeep because that means he gets to tap Jerry's creature so they can't attack while also being safe from a removal spell in response because that would have been devastating. 13. Would have countered both parts, huh? Since, uh, the, since the tap part doesn't actually target. Correct. And here's that lightning bolt for a young pyromancer. And that is going to put Thing in the Ice down to just one ice counter left. And once it wakes up, that's a major hit. Pascal's hoping to draw some sort of cheap spell this turn. He, he did only draw land, so his Snapcaster Mage can't quite get there. I mean, he can cast it. He just has to tap out of Cryptic Command, and he doesn't know what Jerry's last card is. <laughs> we do. <laughs> it's a Blackleaf Clefs. <laughs> right. And there's that Snapcaster Mage. Target Crypta Command. Yeah, so Pascal's going to stack things so that Thing in the Ice flips into a Woken Horror, okay. bounces everything, and then... This transforms. <laughs> uh, the young Pyromancer token comes into play afterwards. So and remember, the Bedlam Reveler does not flip because it is a horror. And then that last token is the one that got created off the Pyromancer after the Thing in the Ice sent everything back to whence they came. And this is a lot of value here for Pascal Viren. Oh, yeah, that advantage bar hasn't moved in a while. No. I, I expect it not to move until we reset it after the game is done. Right. Jerry Thompson, huh? desperate here, finds a Bedlam Reveler. Bedlam Reveler, that's his best draw. So, because fr from Bedlam Reveler is where all his comebacks start. So he gets to play Bedlam Reveler, and if he draws, you know, Fatal Push plus another removal spell, eh, he's still behind, but he, he certainly has a chance.
Jerry has to decide whether he wants to play a tapped land and not lose value discarding to Bedlam Reveler, or just play it and hope to draw an untapped land because he might need the mana. Okay, here we go. Three cards in the hand. There's the other Blood Moon. Yeah, as well as a Lingering Souls he can't cast in a Thought Seize. So Yuck. N not the, you know, the most productive Bedlam Reveler here. But he's going to fire off the Thought Seize. That can get him a Snapcaster Mage or a Young Pyromancer. Yeah, and it's got to be Snapcaster or he potentially dies to the Cryptic Command. An attack. I want to attack with my Awoken Horror. My now lethal Awoken Horror, thanks to that Thought Seize. Yeah. And this is Chump Block with my biggest creature mode here for Jerry Thompson. This one slipped away from him yep. a few turns ago, and it's not looking like there's any way out. Jerry's missing Teamer Battle Rage to give his Bedlam Reveler <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Double Strike and Trample. He finds Collective Brutality off the top of the library. That is a good out, though, because Collective Brutality lets him discard Lingering Souls. In fact, he, oh. could, he could potentially even double Escalate because that Blood Moon is not really doing anything. But either way, it is nice to hit Collective Brutality and actually get an out to kill a Pyromancer and use Lingering Souls and even drain Pascal for a couple points of damage. Escalates once. Just once, he says. So things are escalating not super quickly. No. That's synergy. Look at that deck building. Discard Lingering Souls to collect the Flashback Lingering Souls. Beautiful. Expect nothing else from Jerry Thompson. And there it is. Two spirits to help prolong this game a little bit longer. I just don't know... No, use the right word, prolong. Yeah. <laughs> what, 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 is it, what does the game win look like for Thompson here? Basically, in order for Jerry to win this game, he just has to draw all action the, the rest of the game. Basically, looting could help because it could turn that Blood Moon into something productive, but he, he's going to need to draw a kill spell for the Pyromancer and a kill spell for the Awakened Horror. I'll float a red. Sure. Pascal's going to use Field of Ruin. This one a lot less effective. Yeah. Downgrading a blood crypt into a mountain or a swamp is just not particularly exciting. I mean, if Pascal draws multiple lands in a row and Jerry draws two removal spells in a row, Jerry could win this game. In fact, even just one removal spell for the Awoken Horror and then Pascal never draws a spell to trigger the Pyromancer, that could do it. But especially given that Pascal has the first draw step and almost all his cards really, you know, slam the door shut for Jerry, that... That means that, you know, Pascal is, is quite far ahead here. It's really just lands at this point. We might be running into the, the point of the game where Ancestral Vision actually is not relevant because things could, will be concluded before it comes off suspended. So I suppose lands and Ancestrals are, are all not, not exactly what Pascal wants. Oh, there's was, a land. That was a land, Luis. It begins here. But still... Pascal Vieran gets to apply pressure to Jerry Thompson's life total every turn with Awoken Horror. Though Jerry is one damage point free of the, uh, you know, threat of death, at least just from the Awoken Horror itself, thanks to the Collective Brutality a turn ago. And Jerry has to decide what he wants to attack now, because if he attacks and then Pascal attacks him back with both creatures, Jerry could then block the Pyromancer, fall to one... I think attacking with the Bedlam Reveler does not end up going so badly, because Jerry already has to hope that Pascal has nothing. <laughs> the other play he has, play Blood Moon for the Prowess Trigger. Decide whether <laughs> that, that is worth it. Yep. Looks like he's just going to pass the turn back. Leaving up two blockers for the two threats on the other side. But Jerry desperately needs to find an answer 
for the Awoken Horror, and he also needs to have Pascal brick. And Pascal has a lot of extremely live outs on the top of, or within his library. That was a roast. Well, Jerry's going to be glad he didn't attack. Bedlam Reveler's going to get toasted to a crisp, and uh, there's a Woken Horror. <laughs> well, it would actually work out a little bit better if Jerry did attack, since he didn't get to block with it anyway. Yeah, good point. <laughs> but either way, I think Jerry well, is... Well, he just would have died. Oh, a, no, it was a flyer, wasn't it? In, in, in a quite a bit of trouble you, you here. You are correct, yes. Yeah. So, advantage bar holds strong for <laughs> the duration of that game, effectively. And uh, Pascal Vieran up two games to zero over Jerry Thompson. Kind of kind of interesting too, Pascal actually hasn't picked up an actual loss in the tournament yet, though he has numerous draws. Let's take a look at the sideboards. Uh, now it is time for us to uh, move away to the sideboarded games. Uh, the first two games done, the next three will be sideboarded. And uh, let's take a look at Pascal Vieran's sideboard. What do you like here, Luis? <laughs> well, I like that he hasn't electrolyzed in the sideboard because that's not, not a common sideboard card, but mm. it's looking good in this matchup. Uh, electrolyze, <laughs> Vendillion Click. At, though Vendillion Click does not uh, match up all that well against Lingering Souls, it is pretty good in the removal heavy matchup. Uh, it's also Spell Snare, which can counter Young Pyromancer or Collect Brutality or Terminate. Anger of the Gods, if you get behind in the Pyromancer race, though, that is a little less appealing. And then a Disdainful Stroke, which counters only Bedlam Reveler, which I, I wouldn't be particularly thrilled with either. The good news for Pascal, he just doesn't have a whole lot that he wants or needs to sideboard. If you look at it, his sideboard is geared more towards unfair decks with cards like Crumble the Dust, Molten Rain, Ceremonious Rejection, Dispel. When their game plan goes over the top of yours, you do need sideboard to help. And Jerry's deck, plays the same kind of game Pascal does, even though Pascal is a little bit better suited for it. So he's getting some upgrades across the board here. He's not taking out anything that's completely dead, and he's not adding in anything that breaks the matchup. All right, let's see what Jerry Thompson's up to on his side of the battlefield. Uh, essentially the same. He he can get some upgrades. Nile Spellbomb can cut down on the efficiency of Snapcaster Mage, and he could, if he wanted, add more Collective Brutalities or an Anger of the Gods. Lillian of the Veil, not the most effective against Young Pyromancer. And then Surgical Extraction, you really do want that more for unfair decks than you do for the, the kind of matchup you're playing. So what we saw in games one and two is likely to continue in games three, four, and potentially five. Though I, I think that does extend to Pascal winning. I, I do think that Pascal is ahead here. Even post-board, you like his chances, let uh, alone that he's up two games. I think Pascal might have better sideboard cards than Jerry. Oh, jeez. <laughs> and he was already ahead. Yeah, I'll tell you, Pascal has been cruising through this tournament. He won his quarterfinal match. So stupid, though. Straight games as well. Yeah, that's why he gets to play in the semis, because he won his quarterfinal match. Yeah, how about 3-0? <laughs> Did you have Frank run the numbers on that, Luis? Uh, I don't believe winning 3-0 gives you an advantage carrying into the semis, except per perhaps <laughs> momentum. So we'll have to, we'll have to see. It was see only a matter moment. of time before you dropped momentum on us. Well, I, you we're know, considering putting a momentum bar next to the advantage bar. Oh, uh, so we have three bars then with the right. momentum bar, the luck bar, the, the luck advantage bar. bar. Yeah. We actually decided the, the luck bar was unnecessary. We just um, asked the losing player what the where the uh, advantage bar should be, and that's the same thing as the yeah, luck they, bar. Yeah, those two bars would be just inverses of each exactly. other. Exactly. Players still uh, just taking a look at those sideboard options as we gear up for game number three. Of course, the uh, the winner of this match is going to be facing off against Luis Salvato playing Lantern Control in the finals. I can't remember the last time Luis was in the finals of a pro tour. <laughs> I think Pascal may take a, a short short break away from the table here. Is that allowed? Don't talk to one another. Yeah, if you can go with them, Jürgen, just to make sure they don't see the inflation. Well, we got an empty feature match area here. Why don't we talk about some cards? Uh, we saw a great one earlier. Cryptic Command, really one of the staples of modern for a long time. And uh, for Blue Mages, it's high on the list. 
Uh, Cascade Cryptic Command feels so great. You feel so smart when you do it. You have to pick two options. They're all good. Cryptic Command is one of the few cards in Modern that costs four or more mana, and you just put it in your deck to cast it. Mm -hmm. Right? That, like, if you look at a card like Karn Liberator, which the Tron decks play, you're not really casting it for seven mana. You're tapping three lands to cast it. If you look at cards like Thought Not Seer or Reality Smasher, you're tapping an Eldrazi Temple and some lands mm -hmm. to cast them. Mm -hmm. If you look at Hollow One, you're playing it for zero. D these cards, are, you're not paying their costs. Cryptic Command, you just cast the old fashioned. You tap four islands. <laughs> four islands, and, and you put a Cryptic Command on the stack. Make and sure. when it goes in the stack, you get to choose two of the four modes, and the world kind of is your oyster. If you're winning, it solidifies your lead. If you're at parity, it draws you ahead. And if you're behind, it can let you steal some games. So Cryptic Command is kind of the perfect card for the Blue Red Pyromancer deck and is appropriately the most expensive card in the deck. That's right. You also see that last bullet point, the stunning artwork by the sadly missed Wayne England. He did pass away somewhat recently as well. And uh, I agree, that artwork is fantastic. Uh, one other thing, I, just a memory I have about Cryptic Command going back to when I first started playing was that it was a player rewards card that was the textless. Textless, cr <laughs> textless <And> Cryptic <laughs> Command was aggressive. <laughs> I thought that was a great decision. Uh, it's nothing like quite, quite like seeing your opponent's reaction when you put a textless Cryptic Command on the stack and you say, huh. I'm going to do these two things. And they go, what are you talking about? There's no card that does the that. <laughs> yeah. And then, exactly. And then you tell them all the things it can do and they don't believe you and have to look it up on a phone or a computer <laughs> just to see it. Let's take a look at Bedlam Reveler. These are kind of the headliners from two of these, the two decks that we're seeing here. Jerry, kind of breaking it here with Bedlam Reveler. I mean, this isn't a card that, ha that saw a lot of constructed play either way. Um, but he makes it look great. I, you know, he churns through his library trying to uh, destroy, basically tear apart the opponent's hand, put out a young Pyromancer, and then finish off with Bedlam Reveler to reload. And it looks great when his deck gets to do that. Oh, if you have Bedlam Reveler as reliably two to four mana, this card is absurd. Yes. Two mana, three, four, draw three that sometimes attacks as a five, six is very, very good. And this is part of the reason that this Mardu Pyromancer deck can go, go long. One of the typical problems that like black mid-range decks like this face is like, yeah, you've got hand disruption, yeah, you've got removal spells, but in the middle of the game when you're drawing thought seizes or terminates and your opponent doesn't have cards in their hand or they don't have creatures in play, your deck can kind of stall out. Bedlam Road Roller fixes all that and puts a ton of power onto the board while churning through your deck, finding you Colagon's Command, which then brings back your you know previous Bedlam Reveler or your young Pyromancer. All of it together, this is one of the cards that makes Jerry's deck tick. Yeah, this is the big headliner. And it is fun to watch his deck go when it goes because, man, he gets one of those draws where it's, it's you know, Inquisition, Thought, sees maybe get a couple of things in the graveyard with Faithless Looting, then Bedlam Reveler, and the opponent's just going, are you serious? He just tore apart my entire hand. And now you've got this big threat, and you just, ha you just drew three more cards. All right, looks like the gentlemen are back in the feature match area, getting that last shuffling done here for game number three. I already beat the others. I know, yeah. Stop around so many spells. <laughs> <laughs> A reasonable request from Jerry Thompson, but uh, Pascal's not cooperated thus far. Two more lands me. Yeah, that cost like five weeks. Players, of course, have access to the deck lists of each other, so they will have studied those. And Jerry, a prolific deck builder and deck tuner, will have looked closely at the decisions that. Pascal made when he brought this thing to the table. He was mentioning he's got two more lands. Pascal has more lands, but he also has more cards that say draw a card on them. So he, I think he will still get flooded out a little bit less than Jerry will in a long game. Okay. We are underway here. Jerry Thompson's going to be on the play for game number three, and he needs to put together an epic comeback if he wants to put himself in the finals and try to have a shot to be a two-time Pro Tour champion. As it stands, he's got to win the next three games in a row against Pascal Vieren if he's going to make this happen. Both players kept seven. Serum Visions from Vieren kicks things off. <laughs> and you heard what Jerry said. That one's okay. He's, of course, referring to Ancestral Vision. 
being not okay. Oh, yeah. Ancestral Vision is the real killer, and that is what Pascal has used to pull ahead in these last two games. Again, the winner of this match is going to have the pleasure of facing off against Luis Salvato in the finals. He is waiting in the wings, and uh, right now, He'll start getting that sideboard plan all worked out against Pascal Vieren because it's looking <laughs> like he's the favorite to make it. But never count Jerry Thompson out. <clears throat> Three game wins in a row, and he will be there. Luis Salvato is warming up his codex shredders and <laughs> you know, <laughs> dusting off the lanterns, getting ready to shine a light on the opposing player's <laughs> library. <laughs> Well, a reasonable start for Thompson with a turn two young Pyromancer. There's not much else going on at the moment. Two islands here for Pascal Vieren means he's not going to be taking out that Pyromancer. Yeah, and that, that is good news for Jerry. An unopposed Pyromancer can run away with the game because uh, unless Pascal board an anger of the gods, he doesn't have very many ways to come back from a big board. And even if he did, he's got two islands in play and not, not very close to casting any red spells. Jerry's having fun. He says, wee. He drew his favorite card there, Manamorphos. Manamorphos is about to be a zero mana 1-1 one, one mm -hmm. that draws you a card, which eh, that's a pretty good deal. Cantripping Memnite, I like it. I mean, I've played non-cantripping Memnite plenty of times. <laughs> <laughs> that's less fun, but uh, can be effective as well. And there's Faithless looting from Jerry Thompson, so this could be a very powerful turn for him. Maybe even finding him some hand disruption. Pascal's got triple opt-in hand, or at least double. Jerry could be turboing out one of the faster Bedlam Revelers we've seen. I don't see what Pascal's working with, though, because he does have a logic knot. And Pascal did opt to keep two islands on top with that Serum Vision Scry. Mm. So we know his top card is an island. There it goes. Will Pascal let the powerful Manamorphos resolve? He's thinking about it. No, he's going <laughs> to logic not. Oh, well, that does cost Jerry Thompson a card and kind of the rest of his turn. Yeah, and part of the reason to do that is Pascal could only logic not for one. So if Jerry then added black mana with Metamorphos and cast Thought Caesar Inquisition of Kozilek, Pascal wouldn't have been able to counter it. So it make, makes sense that he did that. He's going to fire off main phase opt and then play a mountain. He's got his own copy of Young Pyromancer, and boy, can he make that thing sing next turn if he casts it. It does need to survive, though. Then he's got Opt, Opt, Cryptic Command. If he Small doesn't cast, yeah, I, I, once you play the Mountain, it's kind of like you're committing to casting Pyromancer, because otherwise you would have wanted to keep up, play the Island and have two Ops up. So right. presumably this was his plan all along. In the meantime, can Jerry Thompson do something about this young Pyromancer? I don't think he's going to be able to kill it this turn. And Jerry's going to go up to four spells in the graveyard. Ooh, collector Brutality. Oh, there it is. So Jerry's going to be able to Thought Seize plus Brutality. He can actually leave Pascal Jeez. with a pair of ops and no other cards in play. Wow. Huge turn for Jerry Thompson. And Jerry also setting up that Bedlam Reveler. He's about to have four spells in the graveyard, five after the Collective Brutality. With the three lands he has in play, assuming he discards his Marsh Flats to the Collective Brutality, this leaves him in, in, in very good shape. Snapcaster. Snapcaster Mage is going to hit the bin from the Thought Seas, and now we're going to see an Escalated Collective Brutality. Kill that, take that thing away. And just as you described, Luis, Pascal is... Somewhat at the mercy of his library here with a pair of ops in hand. An island off the top. Yep. It's going to need to find something with these ops pretty quickly. That Pyromancer is, is a very fast clock, and this is what happened when, a, when unchecked Pyromancer gets, gets played here. 
he found Serum Visions. Yeah. Thing in the Ice off the scry here. Might be a little late for Thing in the Ice. Pascal's not going to be able to string together spells all that easily here. By the way, in front of our coverage booth, I see Luis Salvato making his way back over to the feature match area. We may not need you for a few minutes here, Luis, because uh, Jerry Thompson looks like he's firmly in the lead here in game number three, and he has to be. He has no wiggle room anymore. One more game win from Pascal Vieira, and this match is over. But Jerry's looking great here in game number three. Bedlam Reveler to kind of Finish things off if he wants. Thinking about casting a collective brutality. Yeah, no, I like, he's going to go for the reveler. I do like Bedlam Reveler here. It's just much higher reward if it happens, and you use up more mana. Go. And he finds three spells: Nile Spellbomb, Dreadbore, and Colagon's Command. Off of that, here's another opt from Vieren who finds Lightning Bolt, a little bit late for Bolt. Yeah, and he did not use that, he did not run through all this earlier, and he ended up bolting the Pyromancer anyway. Punished. And now he's just spinning his wheels here with these cantrips. I mean, these can help him find what he needs, but he has flooded out horrendously here. He shows Jerry three lands and says, I've had enough of this. Well, Jerry did Jerry say Thompson Pascal had a great has draw. two more lands than he does, so. <laughs> <laughs> he also politely asked Pascal to stop drawing so many spells, and uh, Pascal apparently obliged. So, two games to one now. That is stage one of the Jerry Thompson comeback if he's going to find his way into the finals. One of the cards that you have to talk about when you're talking about this particular matchup is Young Pyromancer. Both decks kind of showcasing the power of this card. It uh, comes and goes as far as modern goes, but uh, boy, does it, is it powerful when it gets going. It can take over a game on its own, Luis. Young Pyromancer in that game was a two-mana 2-1 two that came with five tokens. Mm -hmm. And that is an absurd amount of power toughness for only two mana. It also rewards you for doing something a lot of modern decks would do by themselves, which is play a bunch of instants and sorceries. Mm -hmm. Combines really well with cheap removal, really well with cards like Thoughtseize, Inquisition of Kozilek in Jerry's deck, or Optin Serum Visions in Pascal's deck. Really interesting to see the two different takes on it. One of them opting for the, uh, the cantrip route, and on the other side, it's more of the proactive hand disruption stuff. But either way, you're getting one ones off a young Pyromancer. Thing of the Ice is another card that we see showcased by Pascal Vieren here. And what this does is it gives Pascal a way to catch up when he's behind. And it's also an 0-4, which against decks like Humans or even Jerry's deck can sometimes just block for a couple turns. Yeah, soak up some damage. As a 7-8 Awoken Horror, it will end the game very, very quickly. And it'll bounce most of the opponent's board. You've even seen it in some matchups you know, sitting there on one counter, ready to bounce something gigantic. And <laughs> against, like, the mid-range creature decks, it can be a very, very effective threat. Even against a creatureless deck, though, it's a two-mana seven-hit, you know, with some w w with a waiting period uh, attached. Yeah, we've seen that. I, I saw Pascal do that a couple of times in post-sideboarded games where the opponent had trimmed some removal spells and a thing in the ice just went unchecked, and it was just flip it, hit you for seven, and the opponent looks down at their hand, and they have these reactive spells. Dispels and, and stuff like right. that. And they look up, and they're like, well, you know, Lightning Bolt doesn't even touch this thing. And they have two turns, and they have to find, you know, one of the very few answers in their deck for Awoken Horror. And it didn't happen. It's also cheap. You know, if you're on the play and you can resolve a thing in the ice on turn two, it's not that hard to do. There's not that many counters that people play that often in Modern that can interact with it. Uh, and so... Yeah, dodges lightning bolts, just a really good card if you set up for it. And it's really showcased here for Pascal. You know, I, I got to tell you, Luis, the first time I, I saw his deck list, I just went down it and I was waiting for, I was waiting for the, the joke, you know? I was like, okay, I get it. Ancestral Vision, Cryptic, Logic Knot, Mana Leak, Optimancer, Visions. Okay, I've seen all these, Snapcaster made some counters, Thing in the Ice. 
and then some removal spells and a young pyromancer and i'm like well what's the like where's the yeah, where's, where's the payoff? yeah and it was just no it's just all these good cards well pascal's playing a deck where despite some amounts of synergy you know young pyromancer and thing in the ice plus <laughs> spells all of his cards really do function by themselves they're mm -hmm. all very good on their own and synergy decks tend to be resilient are not resilient against deck cards like Thoughtseize, whereas Pascal's deck, like, no matter what Jerry ca Thoughtseize this year, the rest of Pascal's cards are going to work fairly well. Wow, look at this hand, too. Two Thing in the Ice, Young Pyromancer in the middle there, as well as Mana Leak. Ooh, Pascal is running into the, the one drawback of Sulphur Falls, though. He'll enter the battlefield tapped on turn two here, which Ooh. so rarely happens in this deck, but Spire Bluff Canal plus Sulphur Falls can sometimes add up to that drawback. Now, he has resolved Serum Visions... Or why is that in his yard? What happened here? Pascal played a turn one Serum Visions. Turn one. So he may have set himself and there, up? There's a chance that there okay. is, is a island or mountain on top of his deck or a fetch land. Okay. Pyro. He's going to take Young Pyromancer as Jerry Thompson. And there it is. That is an island on the top of the library. And that means Thing of the Ice, number one on the battlefield here for Pascal Vieren. Now, Jerry has answers for Thing in the Ice on its own in his library, though I believe Liliana of the Veil is the only one he's rocking right now. Uh, yeah, looks like it. Pair of Nile Spell Bombs. May need to start churning through those. And given Jerry's hand, he might have to just cycle a Spell Bomb this turn. Mm -hmm. But he's going to fetch first because he might want to get Sacred Foundry here and then... Uh, play the spell bomb and leave a swamp on tap so when he sacrifices the spell bomb, he can pay a black to draw a card because Jerry does not have a third land and he would like to hit his, his land drop here. Interesting. He did not get Sacred Foundry even though he has Lingering Souls in his hand, Luis. Well, one reason to wait on that is because of the, the play we saw in an earlier game where Field of Ruin targeted Sacred Foundry. Didn't matter that game, but it could matter here and you do want to make sure you've got a white source left to fetch yep. for when uh, Pascal does eventually use it, that field of ruin. You want to be able to sack one of your fetch lands to go get Sacred Foundry still. But it does mean that he doesn't have the opportunity to cast Lingering Souls like next turn potentially. Yeah, it depends what land he's going to draw, but there are a lot of lands in his deck that would do not cast Lingering Souls. Land number three here from Pascal. Okay. And he's going to go ahead and cycle is Jerry Thompson. And we say cycle, it's not actually cycling, it's just when that thing goes to the graveyard, he can pay black. If he does, he draws a card. But he doesn't have to. It can also just be one mana, get your graveyard. And unfortunately for Jerry, he did not find a third land, which means that this turn, even though he plays something like Young Pyromancer, he, he's not going to be able to do a whole lot else. See if Jerry cracked the Nile spell him right away in order to, to try to find that land be desperation mode if he did. Now, why do you think he didn't run out the Pyromancer here? Uh, he may... He does know that that Pascal has a Lightning Bolt in hand. And a Mana Leak as well, right? And Pascal might be deciding whether he wants to Mana Leak the, the Spell Bomb or not. Remand is what he's going to cast on the Spell Bomb. And Jerry Thompson actually has... Faithless Looting. And so then, that was his plan for the turn. And that'll give Jerry the ability to play another land here. It looks like he did find a mountain. Boy, that worked out well for him. If Jerry would have led with Faithless Looting, he would have got it remanded and not been able to recast it. Yes, this was, a, this was a good bit of sequencing by Jerry, and Pascal did pick up on the fact that Jerry was landlight, so remanding the spell bomb was, you know, potentially a very valuable play, but... Things worked out a little better for Jerry here. Yeah, they worked out beautifully. He found a land and was even able to cast a spell bomb after. Scalding Tarn for Viren. There's Thing in the Ice number two. Now Jerry, especially if he has a land, can go for Liliana, but there's still one card in the graveyard for Viren, and he did get logic knotted in the... Back in game one, Jerry has to keep that in mind. He, he even does know about Mana Leak, so... That's right. Jerry is tempted to, to play Leon, but I think he wants to try to bait out the Mana Leak with the Pyromancer. Pascal, I don't think, cares very much about Pyromancer. He's got Bolt and Roast in hand, so he's likely to let Pyromancer resolve, 
Jerry gets a token off this faithless looting, but Pascal can still just lightning bolt in response. He's going to let him have the faithless looting. Well, the double thing this also does a pretty good job of cleaning up any tokens that may, may stumble out. Yeah, and also blocking the first few, so... Even though Jerry Thompson is pushing his game plan forward quite cleanly, Pascal does seem to have the answers for what Jerry's put forth thus far. Jerry's left with two of his most powerful spells still in hand, Lilian of the Veil and Bedlam Reveler. And that is Lightning Bolt taking down Young Pyromancer and tick-tock go the things in the eyes. I'm afraid that Jerry is going to meet his hands at the claws, I suppose, of some angry awoken horrors this game. The way this game is looking, Jerry's not able to pressure Pascal. His three mana sorceries are not lining up well against Pascal's two mana counter spells. And the fact that Pascal's able to slip out two things in the ice, just have them on board while both players put the cards in their hand, that, that is how you get, you know, attacked by seven eighths that will coincidentally kill Jerry's token on the way in. That said, Pascal just drew a land, and if he just draws, you know, say two more lands, he may not be able to flip the second thing in the ice, even though he, he is able to flip the first. He also may at some point want to cast Roast on the token just to get a counter off both of the things in the ice. That mana leak is doing overtime here for Pascal Vieira, and he hasn't even needed to cast it yet. But Jerry knows about it and has been doing his best to play around it. He has thus far successfully played around it, though. It has prevented him from dropping the hammer. You know, getting Liliana of the Veil on the battlefield to take out one of the things in the ice opens up the door for Jerry Thompson to find another removal spell and maybe find his way back out of this. It's just once the thing in the ice starts flipping, it's so fast. It's yeah, just, it's a it really just fast hammers pump. you and you're dead and you just don't really have any time. And being such huge creatures, they do demand specific answers. Jerry does get to crack this Nile spell bomb. He gets an extra card out of the deal. This also means that if Pascal draws Snapcaster Mages, there might not be that much of a selection to go for, though that Mana Leak in hand means he'll have at least one pretty decent target. Because right. Jerry's a couple lands away from Mana Leak uh, not being able to stop Liliana. Though because Jerry knows about it, if he draws a land in these next two cards, he might just wait till six mana to play Liliana, at which point he essentially did blank Mana Leak. Draw a card. No, there's land number five. Yeah, he does find it. <laughs> There's land, and number, land six. number six. The problem is, is that he's down to twelve. If if Yaren goes, you know, opt, <laughs> things could get out of hand pretty quickly from Thompson's perspective. He knows. Does he know both cards are one card in hand? Ooh, he well, got no. a point of damage through. He did. <laughs> all right. The only card that he has written down still is mana. Yeah, so that, he doesn't that know is, about that. Is the all roast. he knows because okay. he drew the Pascal drew the roast. Post uh, thought sees. Post roast. Um, Jerry looks over at his life pad, still sees that mana leaks written down. And that gives Jerry a very big incentive to, to not cast spells on, unless he has got three mana up. And currently, he Bedlam Reveler only costs two mana. So. Okay, there's also Lingering Souls, but doesn't look great against the. Potential of two Awoken Horrors, though that's a lot of work for Pascal if he is going to get those both flipped. Well, one, one thing that Jerry has to be concerned with is if he casts a spell like this Liliana, Pascal's going to cast Mana Leak and take a counter off of each of his, yes. his things in the ice. I mean, it's going to be really hard for Pascal to resist this. Yes, that is a huge downside, but that does mean that Jerry Thompson can clear the way for Bedlam Reveler, which can block even a transformed thing in the ice is it's also a horror. Right, but if Pascal but draws any spell here, he can roast the Bedlam Reveler, flip one thing in the ice, play that other spell, flip the other one, attack with both, and that's just lethal. And that would be lethal. So he needs virtually any spell in his any library spell in that he can put on the stack at will. Something like Spell Snare or Mana Leak wouldn't work because he needs that roast to resolve. But if he draws Logic Knot, 
<laughs> for example, he could yes. uh, logic knot the, his own spell for, for zero. zero. Oh my goodness. And, and elect to pay. You do actually still have the choice there. This is a huge moment for Pascal Vieira. And and Jerry attacks his with his 1-1 one, one token because he if Thing of the Ice flips, it doesn't matter. Because yeah, that token end. just vanishes into the ether. Also, Jerry can represent Lightning Bolt or something. Yeah, he got a point of damage through. All yeah. right, Pascal, this is, this this is, is it. it. This Pascal just needs to find a spell to put on the stack. He finds a land. Doesn't quite do it. No, there's Roast. Still, this is a strong step in the right direction here for Pascal Vieren because he does get to knock Jerry Thompson down to four. four. And what can Jerry even do from he this point? Flashback Lingering Souls. <laughs> <laughs> he's got a oh, Liliana. Oh, he found Faithless looting, too. And he's got a Liliana. So Liliana can eat the... The, see, the he, unflipped? Pascal actually wants to sacrifice the 7-8 instead of the 0-4 because <laughs> the 0-4, if it flips, gets by the two lingering souls. <laughs> right. But if Pascal misses here, it's much, much worse for him. So this is, this is a close moment. So Liliana hits the battlefield with one loyalty. Jerry's like, you are taking down one of those. And Pascal has an... Come Interesting on, Pascal, decision. Of the card. Sack the seven eight. Draw the removal spell. He's doing it. He's gonna sack the seven I love eight. It. Sweet play. He says, "No, nope, your lingering souls are not gonna be good enough this time." So now Jerry doesn't even really need to flashback lingering souls. No, he because just probably just goes for the faithless the, looting. If the awoken horror flips, the lingering souls just don't do anything. And so Jerry needs to find his removal spell. He needs to find fatal push or terminate. So faithless looting is the way to to do so. But it looks like he may need to find an untapped land in addition. If he wants to cast Terminate, yes. Ugh. Can Jerry do it? Looting. This is huge. If he finds Terminate here, he could be in good shape. He found the Fatal Push. Hey, Fatal Push does it. I'm just going to do this. Wow! <laughs> he says, I'm just going to do this right now. And Pascal Vieren is now down to nothing. Yeah. Pascal nothing in hand. Nothing on the board. No cards in hand. Jerry has a Liliana, which pressures Pascal. If Pascal draws any counter spells, Liliana just ticks up one and blanks them. If Jerry draws nothing, it can still flash back a Lingering Souls, and Jerry has multiple copies of Faithless Looting, so Jerry is now ahead despite being at 4 Oh life. my god, I cannot believe the comeback on that last turn. Jerry casually says, I'm just going to do this right now yeah. to take down the Thing in the Ice. By the way, it would have taken down either Thing in the Ice, so it didn't change uh, from that perspective. Pascal just passes the turn back to Thompson. Suppose Jerry with Inquisition of Kozilek says, well, I'm going to get the card either way. So there, and it was a logic knot, yep. as you Counter described. Counterspell, just not, not, not good here. So what's going to happen now? Jerry's going to just start casting his flashback cards. Oh, and he found Bedlam Reveler. Look at this from Jerry Thompson. He is now all of a sudden running away with this game. His deck is humming on all cylinders. We're going to get a game five unless Pascal draws something really good here. Pascal draws his card and passes the turn back. Dreadbore, Faithless Looting in hand, a Manamorphose. Let's get rid of our... And it's just another counterspell, counter <laughs> counter a remand from Pascal Vier, and he was so close. Now he's leaning out over the battlefield. Like, how did this one slip away? He's just looking and thinking, why did I draw Logic Nonsense instead of Scalding Tarn? Like, you know, wh why did it happen like this? <laughs> oh, he was a draw step away. Red white for Thompson off of Manamorphose, though he's probably just setting up for the faithless looting that he's drawn. And there it is. And he finds young Pyromancer. He's going to be looking to close the door on this game ASAP, right? Oh, yes. And there's young Pyromancer. Wow, and he gets to attack for six with the Bedlam Reveler, too? I have no idea. Jerry. It looks like six, yes. Yeah, it was Lingering Souls, Manamorphose. And Faithless Looting. And Faithless Looting. One, two, three, six. I'm at ten. Yep. <coughs> Go. I'm at ten, says Pascal Viren, and Jerry says, I agree. Wow, this one fell apart on Pascal in such a dramatic fashion. If Pascal ends you up losing... You can tell he's reeling. I mean, yeah. If he loses this game five, he's going to think about that draw step for a long time. He's drawn Snapcaster Mage. That's good for Rose to take out the Bedlam Reveler, the largest threat on the other side of the battlefield. But Thompson with Dreadbore has a way to clear away the Snapcaster Mage and create a two-turn clock. Yeah, he can also minus two Lily if he wants. Mm. He's got a couple different ways to, to skin this cat here. Right, so he's going to go for a Faithless Looting on the flashback. Oh, wow, he even found Colagon's Command. 
What Jerry's not going to do is go to three life and die to a top deck lightning bolt. <laughs> right. That, that would be inadvisable. Jerry Thompson was down two games to zero. He won the next game, had to win all three, and now in an improbable comeback here in game number four, looks like he's on the verge of forcing a fifth and deciding game here in our semifinal. Does Pascal find what he needs? Relic of progenitus for uh, the redraw. <laughs> he gets the sweat. All right. I can't imagine what he can get here. I guess Cryptic Command. <laughs> It's opt. Bottom. Draw. <laughs> and it's Ancestral Vision. Not what he wanted to see. Jerry Thompson picks up this game. All that right. advantage bar flopped real quick back in Jerry Thompson's direction on that one turn. And now we're going to get hopefully an exciting fifth and deciding one to see if it's going to be Pascal Viren or Jerry Thompson. Pascal so close. I love how he played those last few turns. Just didn't get there for him. Jerry attempting the reverse sweep here and you know, two out of three games down. He's got one more and if he can try to mount a comeback here though, Pascal, yeah. feeling pretty good when you're up 2-0. And uh, <laughs> when, when you're all of a sudden back at 2-2, you're, you're starting to feel it a little bit more. Feel a little better, yeah. Let's take a look at Faithless Looting, a card that Jerry has used very well this whole weekend. It is certainly a key part of the puzzle for his Bedlam Reveler deck, as it helps set up a cheaper Bedlam Reveler down the line, as well as finding him what he needs. And boy, did we just see it do that. Found a, a fatal push at just the right moment. Well, one of the reasons that this Mardu deck functions, actually, is because of Faithless Looting. You know, this deck has a lot of cards like Fatal Push and Terminate or cards like Thought Season Inquisition, cards that are great in some matchups and horrible in others. Blood Moon is exactly this kind of card. And Faithless Looting lets this deck smooth out its draws, keep the cards it needs, and then, uh, you know, toss the, the cards it, it does not. It also does make it so your Bedlam Revelers are cheaper. It also makes it so your Pyromancers actually make tokens. And, you know, it, it does a pretty good job of all the things this deck needs so... Despite this deck not having really heavy gra graveyard synergies, we're not discarding giant creatures to reanimate or making our hollow ones cost less. Nah, Faceless Looting does make the deck work. Next card is, uh, you know, we talked about Crypt of Command as being one of the darlings of uh, blue mages everywhere. Well, this one's on that list as well. The closest thing we get to Ancestral Recall outside of Vintage is Ancestral Vision. Same card, but they make you wait for it. Well, it's a very powerful card. It actually sometimes is better because, really? well, when you lead with Ancestral Vision and your opponent thought seizes you, they don't get a choice of any of the cards you're going to draw. Mm. They only get the cards you currently have in your hand. That's true. So, you know, there, there are even some upsides. And all it takes for this card to be good is the time to resolve it. So it's no surprise that uh, Pascal is playing in a deck with a lot of cheap interaction, Remand, Logic Knot, Mana Leak, Lightning Bolt, Roast. And it's no surprise that in a matchup like this, where the games can be expected to go seven, eight, nine turns, Ancestral Vision is a premium card to have in your opening hand. Yeah, you saw that, by the way, that last game when Pascal played Serum Visions on turn one. And Jerry, you know, even though th that's a perfectly good turn one play for Pascal, Jerry was audibly relieved that it wasn't this card because he knows that he doesn't have the ability to kill Pascal before Ancestral Vision comes off of suspend if he suspends it on turn one and it's such a huge problem for jerry because yeah he can't can't interact with it when it's suspended and he doesn't have ways to counter it once it's gonna resolve yeah i guess jerry left his uh wrist sweepers at home today yes and <laughs> <laughs> well this is one of the biggest differences being, between being on the play and on the draw in this matchup is the ability to <laughs> for pascal to suspend an ancestral vision before jerry has a chance to cast thought seizer inquisition of kozlak yeah i thought yeah jerry has a lot of that type of ability in his deck, he's running seven hand disruption spells, four Inquisition, three Thoughtseize. So very likely to be able to cast one on turn one. But if he's on the draw, it does not matter versus Ancestral Vision. Speaking of which, despite a mulligan, Pascal is going to you know reach for a die on turn one. So a good start for Pascal Viren. The wheels have come off a bit for him. He won the first two games in short order. 
Lost the third game fair and square, but that that fourth game, it really felt like he had it locked up or was getting close to it, and it just fell apart on him at the last minute. He's going to have to take a moment to take a breath and gather himself. It's going to be a fun game. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you hear Jerry's response to seeing the Ancestral Vision. All right, well, we've got a game, and Pascal Viren already out ahead thanks to the Ancestral Vision. Yeah, so it's really go but with Faithless Looting rather than Inquisition of Kozilek. It's really hard to argue with that advantage bar. It's already there. <laughs> there it is. Advantage bar is lore. I should have looked at your deck list at some point. <laughs> 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 Jerry says, I probably should have looked at your deck list at he, some he point. He did. I, I, he yeah. obviously knows his deck list, right? I saw I saw Jerry testing uh, against Josh Otter Layton as they were waiting for, for the semifinals <laughs> <Okay>. to be <begin. laughs> Jerry's funny. Yeah, sometimes Jerry says things that aren't entirely true for comedic effect. It's a technique I've heard of, but have yet to employ. Yeah, you haven't quite perfected it yet. <laughs> Jerry says, sick reman buff. He, he really is well, funny. Well, leaving Jerry mic'd up is just a very good decision. Oh, yeah, he's great. And this is how he is all the time, too. He's, he's very laid back, but he's really funny. I wish people talked way more in matches. I, I, think, I do too, actually. I mean, Legit, I do. Yeah, as both a player and a, and a commentator, uh, I, I think it's just awesome when people, when there's a bit of banter. Well, you get a chance to get it. Some of their take it also seriously, you know. Yeah, you, you, well, you get a chance to, to for their person to understand their personality a bit too. There's Mana Leak. Yeah. Lingering Souls goes away. Jerry says fine. So even though Pascal, look, he just traded Mana Leak for half of a Lingering Souls, a card that got discarded to Faithless Looting. <laughs> He's still not unhappy about that because he wants to just keep himself, you know, not behind on board. Just parody's fine as long as you have that Ancestral, which Ugh. will eventually unsuspend and draw you a bunch of cards. It's like this security blanket sitting there. It's just as long as I have my Ancestral Vision coming off the stack and, and I'm not in immediate range of death, you feel so good. Ooh, and Pascal choosing Little not push. to cast Pyromancer but leaving no actual cards up. And Jerry's about to see that. Sure, he's going to say, hey, wait, you didn't have anything. So a little bluff there from Vieren. Why do you think he would do that rather than just play the Pyromancer? It's part bluff and part not wanting to expose Pyromancer to removal spells. So okay. I, I think that it's like a combination of both of those things. Okay, Snapcaster Mage goes away. And then uh, Jerry Thompson's going to go get a Swamp and flashback Lingering Soul. So he is now on the board, but tick-tock, one more turn until Ancestral Vision comes off the stack and potentially gives Pascal Vieren all the tools he needs to win this game and put himself into the finals against Luis Salvato and Lantern Control. So Jerry Thompson again with an uphill battle. And despite the fact that Jerry's deck is humming on all cylinders, turn one faceless looting, turn two flashback souls, turn three inquisition plus flashback souls, like that, that is a very good sequence for Jerry. That vision is just kind of sitting there, ticking down. Pascal's got his eye on it. Jerry's got his eye on it. And it's going to do a lot of the, the heavy lifting in this game for Pascal. And this is exactly what Pascal was trying to avoid. Fatal push. And... Jeez, lightning bolt on a spirit token. I mean, mm -hmm. I know you get kind of free reign because of the ancestral vision, but you card for a quarter of a card, card for half a card, that adds up. It does. And, and you know, Pascal did get rewarded for waiting on the Pyromancer. He got a token that he would not have otherwise gotten. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But yeah, that th those lingering souls are taxing Pascal's resources, and Jerry's gonna get some some Bedlam Revelers out in short order. Well, probably just one, because the first one makes you discard the second. So if Jerry flashes back Faithless Looting, which is, looks like what his plan is here, that's why he's fetching, he'll go down to two instants or sorceries in the graveyard, but as long as he finds one to discard, and he already has a Fatal Push, which doesn't look all that great right now, he's going to be able to cast a Bedlam Reveler next turn, and what this could potentially do is find more cards like Doc Caesar Inquisition. The reason those will be good, well, that Ancestral Vision's coming out, so Pascal's going to have a full group of cards ready for Jerry to disrupt and or tear apart. 
So here's Faithful saluting on the flashback for Thompson. Taking one instant or so. Oh, there's a thought seize. And unfortunately for Jerry, he drew his third Bedlam Reveler. This is really not the sequencing he wants because he's just going to end up binning a bunch of them. I think he discards Fatal Push and a Reveler here. Push because he wants it in the graveyard to make his Reveler cheaper and Reveler because, well, he just does not he want all three in two hand. others, yeah. But, you know, thinking in the big picture, he wants as much firepower cards-wise as he can get, so he'll be kind of bummed to have to give up a Bedlam Reveler, but... Here it is, Ancestral Vision coming off the stack for Pascal Vier, and that's three cards from that, and then one for his draw step. And oh boy, he found some action. There is a, uh, a Cryptic Command. And that's really good for Pascal. The second Cryptic Command is awesome, because what Pascal can do, depending on you know what, what he has the read on Jerry, is play as fourth land, just pass. Jerry casts Thoughtseize, Pascal can just let it resolve, and Jerry stares at two Cryptic Commands. Right. Then if he takes one, Pascal still has Cryptic Command up for the Bedlam Reveler. Where this could potentially go wrong is that if Pascal, Cryptic, countering the Thoughtseize, which is your, your natural inclination, right? Yes. Counter draw is much better than just letting a, them take your card. Right. That does give Jerry the window to, res to resolve Bedlam Reveler. One clue Pascal has, Jerry discarded a Bedlam Reveler to Faithless Looting. Yes, he has just, to look at you that. You don't do that say, lightly. No. So. Let's see if Pascal can figure this out and just show him the hand. It is unintuitive. No, he is going to counter and draw. And this is Jerry Thompson now able to resolve a Bedlam Reveler. He gets a, he gets a free lighting bolt while he's at it. 16, get a swamp. <laughs> you said it's free because it goes into his graveyard and reduces the cost on the reveler and it would have would have been discarded anyway well i, I meant free as in free spirited bolting your opponent's face <laughs> yeah, yeah he it, it's actually he, what you said <laughs> he, he took it to the next level there but and this is it bedlam reveler on the stack and it has resolved so now jerry thompson Okay, go back to that plan you described a turn ago, Luis, where maybe he finds a bunch of hand disruption spells and can tear apart Pascal's hand, even though it's pretty stacked. So, again, Jerry, unhappy to discard two other Bedlam Revelers over these last two turns, but no, Jerry, if it. Jerry can find something like Thoughtseize or Kolagon's Command or even Young Pyromancer, he's going to be able to add a lot more action to the board. And because he's got a Bedlam Reveler in play... Pascal can't just sit there on Cryptic Command. Cryptic Command is at its best when you get to sit back and, you know, dictate the pace of the game. Yeah. It's at its worst, well, though still good when your opponent's pressuring you. Interesting, too, you know, the way that Pascal traded one card for a quarter of a card, one card for half a card, has caught up to him a little bit. He, his hand is actually not that awesome. It's Thing in the Ice, Cryptic Command, Opt. Pretty good, but he... You know, he doesn't have, like, a hammer lock on this game by any stretch. I, I also like Pascal's play here of just playing out Thing in the Ice. He drops the shields for a turn, which is kind of scary in the face of your opponent drawing three off Bedlam Reveler. But Pascal has identified that he's behind, and he's going to need to trigger Thing in the Ice as many times as possible. So he, he, need, he needs to just get it in, into place as quickly as he can. Though Jerry did miss on this Bedlam Reveler. He drew three land in a Dreadbore. Yeah. All right, Pascal needs to find a Logic Knot or Spell Snare. Those are the cards that will get him out of, of this position because Dreadbore is on the stack targeting that thing in the ice. Right, and that'll leave him, if he doesn't find it with just Cryptic Command left, of course, a powerful option, but he's going to need some proactive way to get this game going. Was that Snapcaster? It was, which was a great draw, but yes. does not save thing in the ice in this particular instance. Wow, this game is very much up for grabs at this point. There have been swings. That, that, you know, no that, doubt about it. The poor advantage bar is getting tired from running back and forth. <laughs> just because now Jerry is kind of out of gas. He's got a 3-4 no text because he doesn't have any spells to trigger prowess. And a 1-1 one, one flyer. Pascal has Snapcaster Mage Cryptic. But Jerry has deployed his threats on board. And Bedlam Reveler, it's pretty resistant to getting bounced by Cryptic Command. That's not a play that you really want to make if you're right. a Pascal. I think Jerry would choose to have that happen if possible. But... Uh, so really, this is all on Pascal Vieran. He's the one who has the opportunity. He's the one who's got Cryptic Command plus Snapcaster Mage. But yeah. we need to see where this goes for him because Jerry's ahead on board. He is, though. He, again, you know, Jerry, Jerry kind of hit a stumbling block here Lightning when Bolt. his his Reveler drew all lands. Lightning Bolt off the top for Vieran. That does give him f some flexibility with dealing with the board of Jerry Thompson. 
And now Pascal's hand looks quite good. He can Lightning Bolt, Snapcaster, Lightning Bolt to kill the Reveler, or even just block with the Snapcaster plus the Bolt. Ooh. Use the flashback to kill the spirit. What do you see? Colagon's command. Oh, wow. What a draw step from and Thompson. And this, this was the draw that Jerry needed it because Pascal at some point is going to have to use his mana here. And when the shields are down, Jerry does get to cast that Colagon's command. And that's going to be very uh, soon because... This could go very poorly for, for Pascal. He's actually being very proactive here. Casting Snapcaster Mage, flashing back Cryptic Command... But looks like he's going to leave himself open. And so now Jerry has to decide... We're assuming tap your team draw card here? Yeah, that, that, is, a, that is almost surely what's happening. Mm -hmm. So what Jerry's going to want to do is... One of the modes on Colagon's command is going to be to return a Bedlam Reveler. The question is, do you make your opponent discard a card or do you kill Snapcaster? Discard, you discard, I'm going to return Reveler, and he's going to get that Lightning Bolt out of hand. This is a big opening here for Jerry Thompson because now he has Bedlam Reveler back in his hand, though still cryptic command for Pascal. Yeah, but Bedlam Reveler's back on the menu, and, and all of a sudden, Jerry's just getting this party started. Oh, boy. Look at what he drew off of that, too. Just that was another Colagon's command, a collective brutality in there, and a faithless looting. And Jerry can even collective brutality and if he wants, discard faithless looting. He's just going to pass. I think he wants Pascal to leave all his mana up, and then he starts casting his spells into Pascal's open mana. But I think Jerry is in very good shape here. Jerry Thompson might be on the precipice of a really epic <laughs> three-game comeback, facing down Pascal Vieren from Belgium, down two games to zero. And, and really looking like he was out of it last game and now all of a sudden Jerry is the one who's in the driver's seat Pascal Vieran supremely punished for leaving the shields down just for that one instance and Jerry Thompson has took full advantage well like all good card draw spells Bedlam Reveler snowballs very quickly that was the lingering souls off the top of the library for Jerry Jerry, Jerry has all the options in the world here. He can, he can lead by casting a spell to pump his revelers. He can also just go directly to his attack. He's got to be sensing cryptic command here. And by going directly to attack, he forces Pascal to act before casting anything. So he's going to go with just, as he called it, the duress mode. Look at your hand. And that's going to prompt action from Pascal. He's got to cast something in response here. It's going to be cryptic command to draw. Tap your team. Tap your team. Doesn't want to take any damage here. But honestly, from Jerry's perspective, that's about the best case, right? Yeah, it's a it temporary is. measure, and now the cryptic command's gone. And without a young pyromancer or thing in the ice in play, Pascal's getting no advantage from no. this. This is these are just stop gaps. Lingering Souls is gonna get remanded, and this is a big draw step for Pascal. He needs to find Boy, I don't even know why. He needs to find a lot of action and quickly. He needs to find another cryptic command and a thing in the ice or pyromancer. Okay. Some, it's one of his two mana spells. And that's kind of his like road to redemption here. Faithless looting from Jerry Thompson now. Yeah, and he can discard <coughs> pyromancer land if he wants, or pyromancer lingering souls if he wants, keeping the land to flash back a souls, or he can just keep the pyromancer. Looks like he's making that exact decision right now. And Jerry's not in a, in, in, in a big hurry. I think that discarding the land is fine. It just gives him a better setup for over the next couple of turns. Serum Visions was the draw step there for Pascal, though the thing he drew uh, off of the remand, Misty Rainforest. So that wasn't what he needed to see. And let's see what he does with the cards from Serum Visions. Looks like he may have drawn another Serum Visions as well. Yeah, and Pascal did counter to Collective Brutality and tap. He did not miss a draw of Cryptic Command. Yes, yeah, he counter. Counter and tap your team. And he just has to pass the turn back with two lands in hand against Jerry Thompson. Okay. Jerry just has lethal here. He's, He's going to go Young Pyromancer. 
Inquisition. And Inquisition is going to show him that he has lethal. Two lands in hand means Kolagon's command can kill Snapcaster Mage. And, and Jerry it. Thompson advances to the finals after an improbable three games in a row, defeating the Belgian Pascal Vieren. Wow, in dramatic fashion, oh, too. Wow, that was... Jerry staged a very impressive comeback there, and I, I thought he was just completely against the ropes, both in terms of match count and, you know, in terms of awakened horror count. Yes. Pascal was one spell away from just winning the game. Yeah, he was literally any castable spell that wasn't, you know, a narrow band of counters <laughs> away from just taking the game down immediately, and instead, it wasn't to be. Jerry Thompson is going to be in the finals. Now, he's going to sit down and face off against Luis Salvato with Lantern. And uh, so he's going to have his hands full there as well. But, you know, he's going to try to be a two-time Pro Tour champion. Wow. It's not something that happens very often. Only a few people are in that exclusive club. Jerry's going to try for it. And Luis, he's going to try to stop him. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, though, we're going to be setting up for the finals. Don't go anywhere.
Hello, everyone. We're closing in on finals time here. Yes, we are. A lot later than we thought we might be because that looked like it was going to be all over. But no, and we've got an action-packed warm-up for the final. We've got Brian David Marshall standing by with Jerry Thompson. We'll walk you through the bracket. Brian will be here to talk you through the team series, the constructed master, the draft master. Simon and Maria will talk you through the modern metagame, get you ready for your next modern tournament. We'll hear from Mark Calderera, our social media guy, who's got a fantastic piece on the history of lands and control. And then we'll warm you up for the final, Luis Salvato, Jerry Thompson. All of that in about the next 15 minutes or so. So let's get to it. Down on the floor, Brian David Marshall and Jerry T. Thanks, Rich. I'm here with someone who's already planted his flag on Amon Cat, looking to plant his flag on Exxon. Jerry Thompson, one match away from becoming a two-time Pro Tour champion. Not a lot of zombies on this plane, but I kind of like it, you know? <laughs> it's not bad. You're going with elemental tokens instead this time? Yeah, I like those. Those are the, an old school favorite of mine. Now, uh, walk us through game four. There was a, you, you've been on a tightrope. Yes. This entire yes. tournament, like one life, two life, um, you're facing down against an Awoken Horror and potentially a second Awoken Horror. You play Liliana. What, what's that sequence like for you? What's going through your head? Uh, it, it was interesting because I'm like setting up to try and land Liliana the Veil to take out one and then hopefully I can find a way to deal with the other one, like a Dreadbore or a Terminate or something. And it, it ended up being like a little slower than I anticipated. So he got to flip one, hit me with it for seven, and then he had the other one left with one counter on it. So I play Liliana, have him sacrifice a creature, and he sacrifices the big one because I have Lingering Souls in my graveyard. So if I flash that back, he can draw basically any spell in his deck, transform, bounce the token, and then uh, kill me with the, the thing in the Ice Awoken Horror thing. Uh, whereas if he sacks the small one, I just have two chump blockers and then his outs are very few. Now you're heading into uh, a finals against Lantern Control, one of the fastest decks in Modern against one of the uh, slower decks in Modern. Uh, what, what's your experience like against Lantern Control? Have you, have you played this deck before? Uh, it's, yeah, everyone's favorite matchup to play against, right? <laughs> Certainly favorite to, to watch at home, obviously. Uh, my first time uh, playing against Lantern Control was against Zach Elsick at Grand Prix Oklahoma City. And we were playing for top eight and I knew Lantern and I knew Zach, but like I didn't necessarily understand exactly how the deck worked. And I ended up making a mistake against a Codex Shredder, which cost me the match. And it's like, okay, now I'm gonna do a little bit more homework and I've done some, but not maybe not as much of my due diligence as I should have done. So uh, I'm gonna go study the deck list and hope I don't make any comical errors. <laughs> All right, Jer Jerry Thompson, one match away from taking back Sunday here at Pro Tour Rivals of Ixalan. Thanks so much, BDM. Great stuff from Jerry there. Let's take a look at our bracket and see where we've been this morning and where we have yet to go, and that is the finals. But Simon, I want to know which of these matchups to you stood out as the best and why? I think uh, this match that we just saw, Pascal Viren with Blue Red Pyromancer against Jerry Thompson with Mardu Pyromancer, was the most interesting and also the, the least predictable. We talked to both of these players before. Um, they weren't really sure how it would go. Uh, Jerry actually told me, you know, if, pa if Pascal plays perfectly, I think I'm an underdog in the matchup. And then Pascal was even 2-0 up. It looked like it was a done deal, but a reverse sweep. All the other matchups that we've saw seen have been more or less clear. We were expecting certain archetypes to come out on top. This was, for me, the highlight so far. I want to know if it, it was came down to kill spells versus counter spells. It, it was thing in the ice, something that kind of potentially had the had the option for Pascal to push ahead of Jerry. You could see that when it's uh, stuck and was able to transform, it was an absolute powerhouse. It kills all the tokens. It's uh, still unclear if it's a downside for Badland Reveler not to get bounced because it's a horror, or if it's actually an upside. Mm. Um, but that means that Jerry hasn't found a dread bore, a terminate, or a fatal push. But if he, when he did, uh, that's actually really difficult for Pascal. He just runs out of threats uh, pretty easily. The, there have been some fantastic moments throughout the weekend as a whole, but one that will certainly stick with me is where Liliana of the Veil comes down, Pascal is left having to sacrifice a creature. He has a 0-4, he has a 7-8. <laughs> oh, well. Um, That's easy, right? Easy, yes, easy but, choice. One, one always chooses the 7 8, possibly. Um, it looked like that was a, a, a huge moment in what turned out to be a, an, an epic match. Yeah, Liliana of the Veil still got it. Um, still, I would say, the best planeswalker in modern. And uh, to me, it's actually surprising that we don't see more of her 
it's um, I understand why certain decks are only playing one of one or two uh, Liliana of the Veil, but it's just such a powerful card, especially when you combine it with Thoughtseize. All right, time to move on. Um, Brian David Marshall has made his way to our video wall. He is going to talk about Masters Various and Teams Various. Thanks, Rich. Uh, so we're going to be at the halfway point in our Pro Tour season at the end of this next match. And that means we're halfway to determining who will be the constructed master going to the World Championship and who will be the draft master going to the World Championship. Let's take a look at the constructed master standings and see, and you can see that John Rolfe, John Rolfe who had his breakthrough performance at Pro Tour Ixalan, he is at the top of the standings right now with two Pro Tours to go, 49 match points uh, in constructed uh, BBD, Brian Brown Dewan, your world champion uh, from two years ago, uh, had his best Pro Tour finish actually this weekend. He went 9-1 and one in Constructed, and that's a big part of why he's sitting there in second place. You see Emmanuel Ger Gershenson, and perhaps a name that you're not expecting to see when you're talking about Constructed Master, but that would be a mistake because he really is Ben Stark. Remember, he's won two Pro Tours playing Constructed. So uh, let's move on to Draft. And uh, I'm going to show you surf and turf connoisseur Elias Wath, uh, Wathfeldt. Uh, this is someone from Sweden. He's got a 12-0 record in draft so far uh, this season at the Pro Tour. And he has drafted Merfolk three times out of those four drafts that he's done. The fourth time he drafted, he drafted a dinosaur deck. So there's your surf and turf. He's in first place. Craig Wesco and Alexander Hain and Pascal Vieren, all uh, two full matches behind at 10 and 2. So that's going to be something to keep an eye on down the stretch. And uh, let's take a look at where the team standings are in the Pro Tour team series here. Uh, and you see Team Ultimate Guard has jumped up to 92 points here. Uh, there's no one left who can catch them in the standings. So they're going to be your number one team. Uh, going into the third Pro Tour. Uh, and, you know, when we first started talking about the Pro Tour Team Series, this was a team you absolutely expected to be there at the end of the year alongside a team like Musashi, who won the Team Series last year in great shape to maybe make the finals again. So that's a look at what's going on here. Thanks so much, BDM. Well, we're nearing the finals here at Pro Tour Rivals of Ixalan, but let's widen out the lens a little bit because a lot of people are thinking, you know, what am I going to play in Modern? What am I going to bring to FNM? What am I going to bring to the GP? So let's take a look at the Modern Metagame Breakdown. There it is. Simon, break this down for us. I will, yes, Maria. So Five Color Humans is the new kid on the block, the new deck on the block. Uh, suddenly, we have an aggressive deck that's not hyperlinear with uh, artifacts or just burn spells, but somehow you can play the best humans in modern across all five colors, and that's a pretty beautiful deck. I want to ask this question here uh, Let's as we move forward into day two conversion rates, because this is kind of where the money is. How well did these decks do at the Pro Tour? Which, how, what percentage of players made day two with them? Titan Shift, only 37%. Eldrazi Tron, uh, 76%. And both these decks are kind of about making a lot of mana. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty incredible. Tron was a very successful big mana deck. Titan Shift, absolutely not. 63% um, was the baseline of players that made day two. It's always a bit more than 50% uh, at the Pro Tour. And you can see that uh, Traverse Shadow was extremely successful with a, a bit smaller sample size. Jeskai Control, Eldrazi Tron had good days. Um, Dredge, Titan Shift, and Jerry Thompson's Mardu Pyromancer did not have a good conversion rate, but a pretty good conversion rate when it comes to top two appearances. All right, well, let's take a look, a look at top eight. How did this all break down when you consider the decks that made our top eight? What here uh, is kind of surprising to you, Simon? Um, I want to focus on the, on the bottom three rows. Lantern Control, Black Red Hollow One, and Blue Red Pyromancer um, didn't even make our previous table. Right. Because they were in the other column. They didn't make the, I don't know exactly what it is, the top 16 or top 17 of the metagame. So this really shows if you master a deck, if you build a good deck for the metagame, if you practice with Blue Red Pyromancer like the Viren Brothers, if you build this crazy Hollow One deck uh, like the Japanese pros, you, you can play whatever you want as long as you know what you're doing in Modern. And the Five Color Humans deck, two of our top eight players playing that deck, of course. Does that show kind of that those people had the right take on what the meta would be this weekend? 
almost everyone I talked to was either happy that they played five color humans or that they correctly identified five color humans as an important deck to beat. So I think with two players, it's um, it's correctly represented in the in the top eight of this very diverse pro tour. One last question, Simon, because now out in the real world, we've, we're down to two players in this room, but millions of players out there. Next Modern Tournament, there's Grand Prix Toronto, just six days away. If you were going to Toronto to play Modern on the basis of this weekend, what would you sleeve up next weekend? Uh, I really like Traverse Shadow because it's so versatile. And once you have these kind of tables and this kind of information, you can tune your deck accordingly. You can play it three colored, four colored. You can choose your sideboard cards. Almost every sideboard card in Modern is available to you. All right, well, it is time to turn our attention from the millions of you out there to the two people left playing Magic in here. It's time to preview the final. Now, about an hour from now, maybe Lantern Control is going to be a Pro Tour winner. Maybe it's going to be just a Pro Tour finalist. But, you know, it's a deck that causes a lot of people to think long and hard about the direction of the game. And Mark Calderero, who's been our social media guy all weekend long posting the thoughts of others, took the time to record a little historical perspective on what is really an extraordinary deck. Hello, Magic Universe. This is Mark Calderaro uh, coming here with a kind of special report or just monologue about how excited I am. <laughs> in, the, in the heat of all this amazing Pro Tour of Rivals of Ixalan drama, uh, there is one thing in particular that has hit me so hard that I just kind of want to share it with you because it cuts to the heart of what I love about modern and what I love about magic as a whole. And that is Lantern Control. I know it's an extremely controversial deck for many, but for me, it it's hard. My heart races when I see it perform well, when I see anything about it, and, and here's why. I've been watching this deck for five years now or something crazy like that since its very beginnings on the MTG Salvation boards, right? And at the time, it was nothing. It was this brewer's deck. It was this kitchen table deck. It was brought by people who go to GPs to lose just to see if they can do it. And it was made up of cards printed 11 years apart. We haven't seen a deck this innovative that attacks from a completely different axis. We've seen control decks that attack the hand, that attack the battlefield, but we've never seen a control deck that attacks the top of the library. In 25 years of magic, this is the first time that a deck attacks at a completely different way. Frigorid was the thing that brought it from I'm replacing my hand with the graveyard. If you're not attacking my graveyard, you're wrong. And Lantern is saying, you better stop me from controlling the top of your library. This is a deck that went from the kitchen table to GP grinders like Zach Elsig, all the way through future Hall of Famers like Sam Black. And now maybe, maybe it'll win the Pro Tour. And maybe we'll look back on this moment and say, you know what, Lantern is too good. War of Invention is too good. And you know what, it's not ever this shouldn't be here now, but we're not there now. So I think it's important to recognize that here, now, Lantern is a deck like no other, and one of the reasons why Modern is the most incredible format in Magic. Thank you. There you go, Mark Cordero with some thoughts on the Lantern that may take control of the Pro Tour. So let's get to the final, Maria, who have we got? All right, Luis Salvato, let's kick things off here with the Gold Pro from Argentina, Team Haro Yuyo Latin, second Pro Tour top eight, most recently eighth at Pro Tour Shadows over Innistrad, five GP top eights and one team win. Let's take a look, Lantern Control, we heard all about it from Mark there, all right. This deck, we've seen it in action, but what does it basically want to do? It locks opponents out of the game. It uses War of Invention to find its lock pieces, and uh, those are Lantern of Insight combined with most often Codex Shredder. Uh, Pixels of Pandemonium plays a very uh, similar role. And then, once you are controlling what, you, what the opponent can draw and cannot draw, you make sure that you are not dying with Ensnaring Bridge and if you need it, if you need it, Witchbane Orb. It's a very, very powerful deck and as soon as the lock is assembled, it's almost impossible to get out of. I want to know what Luis might be worried about from a deck like Mardu Pyromancer. So, Tricky are always cards that destroy artifacts that are already in players' main decks because uh, 
against some matchups, the, there, there are ex exactly zero cards. But uh, Kolagan's command in the main deck is a problem. And what you should be looking out for as well is um, effects that draw multiple cards. Faithless Looting and Bedlam Reveler circumvent the Lantern Lock. If I am allowed to draw three cards, you can only control the first one I draw. I will draw the next two no matter what. Well, standing in the way of Luis Salvato is this man, Jerry Thompson, a Platinum Pro, 343 lifetime pro points. He's going to go way past 140,000 lifetime earnings. Can he be a two-time Pro Tour champion? This is the deck that he will be using to try and do so. It is Mardu Pyromancer. There we are, Simon. So what are the main tools he has to work with? The main tools in, in general are Young Pyromancer and Bedlam Reveler. That's how he wins most of his matches. The rest of his deck is really just built to support these threats and value cards. So lots of instants, lots of interactive cards, but he's actually he actually wants to play against creature decks. I've called this a great choice for this Pro Tour because Five Color Humans was a very popular deck. We saw him uh, deal with Thing in the Ice, but Lantern plays zero creatures, so that could be a problem. We're going to see history one way or the other. One of the most astonishing and polarizing decks the game's ever seen, becoming a Pro Tour champion, or one of the most popular players the game has ever seen, becoming a two-time Pro Tour champion. Simon, which do you think we'll be talking about in an hour's time? I am going with Lantern Control here. All right, let's see if he's right. It is time for the final of Pro Tour Rivals of Ixalan.